Morning, guys and girls. I just posted the link to your quiz. Uh, you are taking till 10.32, first 12 minutes to work on the quiz, so you guys can start it now. I'm just going to keep posting it in. It's the mini quiz, guys. Come on. Mini, mini quiz. Just eight questions. No big deal. All right. You can use your notes from yesterday. We went through the powers of the um, federal government, the state government, the shared powers. We did all this stuff yesterday. There's nothing to study for. It's open notebook, so uh, you guys can start with that. Um, I will, while you're doing that, I'll be taking attendance. So people that are coming in, again, this is the link. Let's do it. Sure, Anisia, come on. What's the question? So people don't directly elect the president, Anisia. They are going to try and get enough votes for the state, and then the state is going to have the electoral vote. So you're basically just trying to win the state. So people do vote for the president, and their vote does count, but that's different than directly electing the president, okay? Um, if no people vote, then the president can't be elected. If few people vote, then the people that do vote will have a lot larger of a say but that is different than actually directly electing the president. So the people do vote for the president and they do elect the president, but technically speaking, it's, they're getting, trying to get electoral college votes. All right. So your vote is not worthless, but it is much more meaningful to vote for a mayor. Your vote will count more for a mayor or a person in the house of representatives than it technically would for the president. All right. For those that came in a little bit late, I am posting the quiz here. You're welcome. You have until 1032. I'll give you 1033 now, okay, because everyone should be started. Some people came in late. Um, so please work on that.
Yes, when you're done, you can submit. I'm going to share my uh, screen now if you want to get a head start on the focus question. Um, you'll notice the focus question has some vocabulary, so you should copy that down too. But uh, everyone else, you still have five minutes, so you don't have to do that this second. You'll notice some uh, notes in black. You don't have to copy that down. Um, but concentrate on the quiz for now. I think some people just snuck in here late. There's a quiz going on right now, a mini, mini quiz. So I just posted the link. Please do that. Correct, Liz Mel. You don't need to copy down the, uh, the notes on the left. That's actually all seventh grade review stuff. Okay. Take two more minutes, guys, for the quiz. Remember, I'm going to hold you to that time because every time when I say it's over, you have like 10, 15 seconds to turn the thing in. Otherwise, it's going to be late. You're going to get 10 points off. So two minutes. Okay, Rena. Um, you're gonna have to take this quiz. Try and get as much done as you can. I don't know what happened on my quiz. Yes, Liz Mel is a quiz. Please click on the link. I don't know what happened on my quiz, but it just submitted. So again, Tiana, it didn't finish. You just like submitted by accident, sort of thing. Oh well, no, you're good. You did fine. I'm looking at yours now. Yes, Moise.
All right, got one more minute left. At this point, you have 30 seconds left. Your test submitted too? What does that mean? It's submitted, but you didn't submit it. Or, right, sure, what's your question? President can serve two terms, yes. Correct. We'll go over why FDR did a second term. We're actually going to get into that a little bit today. Yeah, kind of, Mahin, kind of. A little bit more than that. All right. Um, I mean, Abigail, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm looking at yours. I don't. I don't know what that means. It put answers that you didn't put. So, like, I see you clicked on certain answers. All the answers are clicked on. I don't know what that like means, sort of thing. Same thing, Emmanuel. Well, guys, I don't. I'm not quite sure. I mean, it should be simple. You click an answer, and don't click an answer unless you know what the answer is, because it may submit it. I, I've never heard of this before. This is all new to me. I've been doing Google Forms for like nine months now. I've never heard of this. Yeah, I've been doing quizzes for now. I have different answers than what it says. I mean, Abigail, I believe you, but I don't, I don't know exactly what I could do. I, I mean, I don't know if I could let you take it again because then someone could take, say the same thing. You know, it's like if you mark the answers wrong sort of thing. Sure, screenshot whatever you did and then email me the answers. That's fine. All right, we need to move on, though. Um, so this was just a mini, mini quiz. This isn't going to really hurt your grade too much or help your grade too much. It's just something to check in on. Um, looking at some of the grades, I see a bunch of people got 100s, and I see some people got, like, 4 out of 16, 6 out of 16. So um, I'm a little confused with that because you're able to use your notes from yesterday. If you just looked at the notes, I mean, you get at least half the questions without a problem. I mean, the wording of it may not be the best. So we really need, need to make sure that we're paying attention. Um, and we're taking the notes the way we're supposed to, because they should be kind of right there. Um, but we need to move on. So what's the importance of the first president of the United States? Um, we're going to get focus in on George Washington now, and we're going to see, um, why he kind of goes down is even today is one of the best presidents in American histories. Um, so let's go through a couple of things. So the only thing you had to copy down at this point was the focus question, the vocabulary. I will mention the stuff on the left here. Uh, this is some things from seventh grade. Um, as you know, the Articles of Confederation, there was no president. Uh, so the Constitution, when we did the executive branch, it called for a central leader. Um, so the new constitution is going to put in this leader and they decide to call it a president. Um, 
they don't they make sure they don't use the words king or dictator they're just going to choose the word president because he is technically presiding over the country okay so he is our central leader um pretty unanimously the people are going to decide and vote on george washington to become the first president of the united states um you'll see because of his success in the revolutionary war and his character he is someone that uh, was an easy pick to become the first president um, and what was remarkable was usually when people become kings and become leaders, power is going to go to their head, so to speak. Um, hold on, Lizmo. Um, yeah, I guess just accidentally press submit new response. Oh, no, don't do it again. No, I got you, Lizmo. No, that's fine. Just whatever the first one you did is fine. All right. And um, no problem. So George Washington made sure that he did not rule America like a king, and he made sure that he kept everyone in his, kept in his political decisions. So he was very good about being transparent with the American people, be, being transparent with the people around him. And uh, he knew that essentially he um, didn't know everything. So he really relied on other people. Um, power did not go to his head. I'm not sure I would do the same thing if I was president, I imagine – that I may try and get a little bit more power if I was the first president of the United States, but he does not do that. That's because of his history. He fought against King George III, essentially, and he doesn't want that to happen again. So he was the perfect president to start off our country. Um, even though he wasn't a perfect person, he was a very good president and goes down as one of our best in American history. All right, so foreign policy. This is the first time you'll see the word. It will not be the last. But essentially, every president, is going to have what's called their own foreign policy. Now, depending on the type of president you are, it will change, okay, depending on your relationships with other countries. So foreign is another word for other country, a country that's not the United States. And a policy is like a rule or some guidelines. So this was a government strategy or relations with dealing with other nations around the world. So how was George Washington, okay, and one of the major roles the president have is being our chief diplomat, being the chief person who runs our country's foreign policy and relationships with other countries. It's the president's job to try and keep good relationships. All right, so he's going to be the first one that has to work through foreign policy, and you'll see kind of what he does um, that is very effective. All right? And even though he was the first president, he's going to set a lot of precedents. So... Since he was the first president in the job, many people are going to follow his example as a leader. All right, so this is why our, we only had a president running for two terms, because that's what George Washington would do, okay, and set that example early on. So it's an early event that sets an example for future situations to follow, and you'll see how this kind of breaks down here. All right, so moving on. Let's look into the highlights of Washington's presidency. Now, this stuff you will have to copy down. Now, we will not do this with all of the presidents, but we will do this with some of the major ones where I really want to just make sure we understand why this president was not necessarily good or bad, but what they did that really helped effectuate change in our country. Okay? So the first thing is, okay, so you copy down what's in red, but you should look through all of it sort of thing. Um, he created a cabinet of officials, which we'll talk about, but what I really want to notice, which you're not writing down, is he was president for the first um, eight years of our country, first eight years of the Constitution. Um, notice the Constitution goes into effect in 1789, therefore we need to elect a president. In both elections, the election of 1788 and the election of 1792, um, let's see, Anisia, Trump's presidency will tell for, so Anisia, so we got to be careful about this whenever we talk about a current president or any president, there's certain things that presidents do well or not do well. So certain things Trump has done well, certain things he's not done well. Every president is going to do certain things, okay, that are going to be examples for future presidents. Um, whether you dislike a president or not dislike a president doesn't mean that future, um, things won't be followed. So, for an example, Trump's character and his rhetoric and the way he speaks probably will not be something that is followed by future presidents, but maybe his foreign policy will. His foreign policy has been a lot better. So every president, again, they wear a lot of different hats, 
okay? Not liking a president or liking a president is a very subjective thing. So it's trying to pick out, you know, what they do well, what they don't do well, because every president does things well and every president doesn't do things well. It's a very, very tough job. No president's been perfect. No president's been so incredibly horrible that they haven't done anything right. Okay, so that's that's just the thing I think you'll learn as you get older. Okay, that you know, presidents have a very tough job. So I would definitely say the next president, if it is Trump or Biden or whoever it is, will learn from those mistakes and go along with the good things that happen as well. All right, so you ran unopposed for both terms, which is a very tricky situation because all of our elections have had at least two major candidates. But pretty much everyone knew that Washington was going to win. So he ran unopposed, and those first two elections were pretty much worthless because he won 100% of the electoral vote, so he became the president, okay? The next thing, and the first major thing he does was, again, he was a very humble guy, George Washington, he was, so he realized he didn't know much about a lot of things. He knew military strategy. He knew how to conduct a little bit of foreign policy, but he wasn't an expert. So what he did was he hired a cabinet of four or five major officials to work under him. So to give you an example, he knew nothing about the economy, but he knew what one of his leaders, one of the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, did. So he created a position called the Secretary of Treasury. All right, this is why Alexander Hamilton's on the $10 bill, let's say, because he was the first person that ran the economy in our country. Okay, and he would report to George Washington, and George Washington would make the final decision after hearing from Hamilton. He had um, a secretary of state led by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, as we know, eventually become a president in this country. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. He was very good in foreign policy. So he relied on Thomas Jefferson to kind of speak him through that. Um, uh, Henry Knox uh, would be the secretary of war. So if there was a military situation, he would rely on Henry Knox. So he created these positions in our government. There was first originally four people in the cabinet. Okay, now in the United States in 2020, I think Trump has 15 cabinet members, and that's pretty much more of the number. I think Obama had 15. I think uh, George W. Bush before him had 15. So that's pretty much the number. Um, there's more people in the cabinet because you have assistants and assistants and secretaries, but like those are the 15 major people in the cabinet. So the Constitution was first supposed to consist of the president. Excuse me. The Constitution said the executive branch should just consist of the president and the vice president. But Washington expanded that power and says, I don't know everything, so I need to create a cabinet of officials to help work with us. All right, a major check and a major balance that the executive branch of government has is they are able to appoint Supreme Court judges. He's going to appoint the first six, okay? Uh, one of the major ones he appoints is uh, Chief Justice John, John Marshall, and he will be a huge um, leader of the Supreme Court, okay? Um, and then John Jay as well. These are some pretty famous historical figures. John Marshall specifically you will learn about as being a um, major person in our country in terms of Supreme Court cases. You'll learn his name soon. All right. His toughest moment is, in his presidency happened to be through what's called the Whiskey Rebellion. So remember, under the um, British king, our country went in rebellion versus Great Britain and overthrew the king. Okay, and we became our own country. Under the Articles of Confederation, we had the Shays Rebellion, and Shays Rebellion proved that our country's federal government was too weak because they could not stop the rebellion. We're going to have a separate rebellion called the Whiskey Rebellion, okay, which I'm going to give you some brief information. I want to watch a quick two-and-a-half-minute video on it, too, to give you a sense of why it was important. All right? So um, whiskey was taxed, okay, to ha help pay back the debt from the Revolutionary War. This shouldn't be much of a surprise because they kind of did the same thing with the Shays Rebellion. So many people rebelled against Washington and the government, and you're going to see that they're actually going to try and go and burn Pittsburgh, which is a place in Pennsylvania, to the ground because this is where it's happened. So George Washington, as our new commander-in-chief, now can use the military to stop any rebellion from happening, and that's what happens here. Washington's going to send in the mil military – He's going to squash the rebellion, okay? And it's going to prove how strong the new constitution and how strong our president is now. You can't just go around and try and rebel and overthrow our government anymore like you did under the Articles of Confederation because the constitution's stronger. 
All right, so I'm gonna share this video. I'm gonna mute myself. The first minute and a half is kind of like blah, like you don't really need to know it. But the last minute and a half um, is important for understanding how Washington handled this crisis. Now, one of the earliest tests of the U.S. Constitution was the Whiskey Rebellion from 1791 to 94. What is the Whiskey Rebellion? Well, first off, it's not when you drink too much Jack Daniels and your stomach rebels against you. We better start at the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles, some of the states, like Massachusetts, had accrued massive debts, which those individual states were responsible for. When the country decided to ditch the Articles in favor of the Constitution, these debts gave the new national government a credit score worse than a college freshman with a Visa, Amex, and H&M card. Alexander Hamilton knew the best way to deal with these debts was through assumption, which meant all states' debts would be consolidated into one national debt. Yes, thrifty states like Virginia complained about having to pay other states' debts, but it's funny how people get on board when you promise to place the capital in their backyard. So it's 1791 and time to pay the national debt of 75 million, which was about 2 billion back then. First, Hamilton turned to everyone's favorite topic, tariffs. Ugh, I know students hate hearing about tariffs, but they really are important. They allow the government to make money on imported goods while at the same time protecting domestic goods. The second method was a tax on whiskey. Why whiskey? Well, whiskey was kind of money back then. Many Appalachian farmers distilled their excess grain into whiskey and sold it to supplement their income. Paper money was in short supply and many were skeptical of a national currency, but whiskey was readily accepted as payment. And, well, it's alcohol. America has had a sizable BAC level since the beginning and whiskey made money. As you can imagine, many small distillers had a problem with this tax. First, they didn't like the idea of a tax on their product to pay off someone else's debt. And secondly, you either paid a flat fee or buy the gallon. The large distilleries could afford the flat be with the smaller guys we're stuck with the per gallon tax. Small operations saw this as the Constitution sticking it to the little guy. Now, some of those small operators in western Pennsylvania decided they weren't gonna pay no stinking whiskey tax. Using techniques that echoed the revolution, they erected liberty poles, cried about taxation, and even tarred and feathered tax collectors. Things got progressively worse in western Pennsylvania between officials and opponents to the tax. When rebel leader and revolutionary war hero James McFarlane was killed, it was on. About 7,000 protesters marched towards Pittsburgh to burn it to the ground, shouting independence and even had their own flag. But you have to remember who was president at the time. That's right, George Washington, and he was ready to show these rebels that they weren't dealing with no weak Articles of Confederation central government. This was the U.S. Constitution central government. All in all, nearly 13,000 men of the federal militia, many drafted, were led by President Washington himself to western Pennsylvania. And as you may expect, the insurrection quickly collapsed. A handful of men were hung for the Whiskey Rebellion, but more importantly, Washington and the federal government showed that under the Constitution, they had the power to enforce the law. So that's the Whiskey Rebellion. Leave a comment on what topic you'd like to see. Okay, guys and girls, so this is the kind of visual I want you to kind of see with Washington. He's a stronger version of what we saw from the Articles of Confederation. They can handle a rebellion, okay, because he was able to send in the military. He had the, mil he had the constitutional power to do so and act as commander-in-chief to stop the rebellion. Now, the people from the Whiskey Rebellion would be captured and uh, sentenced to jail, and then some of them would be hung for the death penalty for uh, committing um, um, – Oh, Jesus. Tyranny against the government. All right. Uh, betraying the country, so to speak. And this proved the federal government was strong enough to handle uh, this type of rebellion. So that's a really good thing. Now, going back to the PowerPoint, I know some of you probably were not done. Okay. One of the biggest things is he voluntarily chose to step down as president after a second term. Now, could he have run a third term, a fourth term, a fifth term? Absolutely. OK, but I think he was quoted in saying one time, like, if you've been president for eight years, it's long enough to run the country. We got to try and give someone else a shot. Um, so he sets a precedent when he does this. He sets an example that the next 30 presidents will follow. There was no law that stopped anyone from running for a third term. But essentially, if George Washington didn't run for a third term, then the next president shouldn't either. Now, this would change after Franklin D. Roosevelt becomes president. We will start to look at why. But Franklin D. Roosevelt's the only one that's run for a third term and a fourth term. Um, we'll learn why that's 
not allowed to happen again a little bit later on, I think on Thursday. Okay? Um, so he sets this example, which is a great thing, but uh, he sets up a lot of examples. He sets the precedent of a cabinet. That's not something written in our Constitution, but every president since Lincoln and since Washington has had a, uh, a cabinet of officials. He sets the example with the Whiskey Rebellion that the military can be brought in to stop rebellions from happening, and not many rebellions will happen after that. And so he sets a lot of examples that are very good. But by far the most important thing of his presidency was his farewell address. Now his farewell address warns the Americans of four things in their future. Okay. Now, when you're a president, you get elected, you have what's called an inauguration address, where you go in and you give a speech to the country, kind of laying out your plan for the country, okay, after you get elected. Then every year, you're going to have what's called a State of the Union. You're going to give a speech to the country to let them know how the country is doing and what the plan is going forward. In the last day of your presidency, at the end, not the last day, but at the end of your presidency, the president gives a farewell address. George Washington gives by far the most important farewell address in American history. Maybe Dwight D. Eisenhower is up there with him, but for this class, it's definitely the farewell address. Okay, and why he is going to, uh, why this address is so popular, why this speech is so popular, is he's going to warn America of four things in their future. Okay, and we're going to briefly just look at the speech. Okay, so I'm not going to have it on the screen, but as you're going through it, if you want to open up the document, okay, that has the address, okay, we're going to pick four, the four paragraphs that I deem to be the most important. Um, I'll kind of explain where they are. All right, and you can follow along with the reading as I do it. Okay, but essentially why this speech is so important is George Washington was almost being prophetic, meaning he was almost prophesizing the major problems that are going to plague our country. And he's going to hit the nail right on the head. Uh, he's going to warn the country of some major issues that he worries that will happen, and he'll kind of predict some major problems. So essentially what I'm saying is if we had just listened to Washington, so to speak, then there is a good opportunity that the country would not have gone through some of the problems that it did. Okay, so if you're following the reading, and I'm looking on a separate screen here, uh, Liz Mel, that is one of the four warnings. Yes, I could tell you've done your textbook reading, or you remember that from last year, but we'll go with the textbook reading, all right, which is a perfect way to remind you guys that tomorrow is textbook Thursday, uh, so make sure you do that. If someone isn't president anymore because they have served their terms, what happens to them? Like, are they poor? No, well, actually, Rosemary, it's quite the opposite. Um, Usually they leave a pretty wealthy life after that because they're, the salary of a president isn't much. You don't get paid a lot of money, actually, uh, but you become so popular because you are a president, you could pretty much get any job that you want. So many presidents just either retire and go on like book deals, like Obama's like the last president that we have is no longer president. He's very wealthy now because he can go on book deals, he can write books, he can go on interviews, and he gets paid a lot of money for that. But um they don't become poor or middle class again. I wouldn't say that. But they go back to living a pretty normal life. Other presidents, uh, William Taft is a great example. He'll become a Supreme Court justice. All right. But let's go through. Um, so don't worry about the vocab just now. Okay. So Washington's four warnings and farewell address. We're going to read them, and then I'm going to stop and go over them to make sure we're on the same page. So the first one that we are writing down is going to be in reading, is going to be the fourth paragraph on the first page. It starts with in contemplating. All right, so we're going to read that one together. All right, and we go from there. So, in contemplating the causes, this is Washington during his address, in contemplating the causes which may disturb our union, it occurs at a matter of serious concern that any ground should have been furnished for characterizing the parties by geographical discrimination. So he's talking about geography, okay? And he lists Southern, Atlantic, and Western designing men may endeavor to excite a belief that there is a real difference of local interests and views. One of the expedients of party to acquire influence within a particular district or area is to misrepresent the opinions and aims of other districts. 
You cannot shield yourselves too much against the jealousies and heartburnings which spring from these misrepresentations. They tend to render alien to each other of those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. So Washington's first warning deals with geography, and his first warning is avoid sectionalism. So you guys should write these down in your notebook, and we'll talk about what sectionalism means. Now, when we get to the tail end of Unit 2 in, like, December, okay, late November, early December sort of thing, you're going to learn what sectionalism is, but I'm going to give you a brief introduction of what it is. Sectionalism is believing and fighting for what's best for your area or your town or your city as opposed for what's best for the entire country. So if you're from the South, okay, you're fighting for what's best for your particular area of the South, things like farming, things like slavery, as opposed to doing what's best for the entire country. All right, so you're just copying down what's in red, but the biggest example is slavery. All right, when you have the South and the North differing opinions on slavery, and they're not making one uniform de decision about maybe banning slavery, people are doing what's best for their particular area. Okay, you could do that living in the city of the Bronx right now. If you live in the Bronx and you're just like, I only care I'm from Bronx, born and bred, and that's all I care about. Well, then that's not good because you're what's a part of a sectional group. You're just doing best for, you for what's best for your area as opposed for the entire country. And Washington's saying as a new country, we need to make sure that we do that. Okay. The next warning he's going to give is in the second to last uh, paragraph. Okay. Starting with political parties. So second to last paragraph on the first page that is. All right. So political parties serve always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms. All right, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption from other countries, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passion. Thus the policy and the will of one country are subjected to the policy and will of another. So warning number two, don't create political parties. Now what is prophetic about avoiding sectionalism is he was correct because sectionalism led to the civil war. One of the biggest problems we have in the United States right now is going to be the, and I mean right now in 2020, is that we aren't necessarily divided between male and female. We aren't necessarily divided between white, black, or, or race. The biggest thing that divides our country in 2020 is going to be the political parties. Republicans and Democrats do not really get along. So what does this end up meaning? Well, this political party is a group of voters who all believe the same way a government should be run. Okay. So let's take an issue. Let's take abortion, because I know we kind of already kind of had that conversation very briefly. The groups of people that are Democrats will believe, you know what, abortion, there should be women should be allowed to um, make their own choice and abort the baby if they choose to. We're Republicans, their point of view may be, you know what, we think that abortion shouldn't be allowed and we should, the, the fetus and the baby should be kept alive. That could be a political position in uh, for pu Republicans and Democrats for abortion. Now, there's hundreds of topics, but essentially he's saying, let people decide things on their own. Don't create political parties, okay? Don't have these two things that are going to basically where people are going to join up and just blindly follow that group, okay? And he warned us about this, and it is so upsetting because the second after he leaves office, two political parties are created. They're called the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, okay, which you guys are already kind of familiar with. And eventually, over time, that's changed to the Republicans and Democrats. All right, so political parties will go into a lot more detail, but he said, don't create them. And literally, the second he leaves, we create them. And this is, I think, a huge reason why our country can be divided at times, because people don't see eye to eye with how government should operate and should run. All right. The next thing is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not even going to go to the reading because we're just running out of time. I would just like to mention number three, straightforward. It's just good life advice too. Okay. Number three, don't fall too far into debt. Okay. And this is for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is good life advice, but as a country, okay, you do not want to owe countries or other people money. 
All right. What happens is when you fall into debt, okay, the economy is not going to do as well. All right. This has been a huge problem for our country um, throughout history. We saw in the Revolutionary War was a huge problem. Great Britain was in debt. They taxed the colonists. It led to a war. Okay, when you owe someone money, you have to owe them favors, and that could be a huge problem because if you you're fall far into debt, you have to go to other countries for that money. Okay? And right now in 2020, our national debt, the amount of money we owe is over $27 trillion. And you unfortunately got to understand in our future, that's going to be a huge problem for us if we don't pay back that money. Our economy will suffer uh, big time. So you can go into debt for a little bit, but don't fall too far into debt. And this is another warning that we did not follow. Okay. The biggest, yes, 27 trillion you hear. Uh, and the debt keeps increasing. Yes, as of now, it's going up uh, hundreds of dollars every second. All right. So we need to figure that out quickly. All right, so we'll talk about that later. But by far, the biggest warning that Washington gives in his farewell address is number four. And it's highlighted because this is the one that majorly comes up on the regions. Um, and when you see Washington's farewell address, you got to think foreign policy and you got to think neutral. Okay, so what does it mean to be neutral in something? If two people are in a fight, okay, if uh, me and Mr. DeMassey get into a fight, you have choices. Do you defend Mr. Panio? Do you defend Mr. DeMassey or do you stay neutral? Staying neutral means you're staying out of it. You don't pick sides. You're almost minding your business, so to speak. Okay. Washington was very steadfast in saying, we're a new country. We don't have a military that's very strong to stand up to issues. So a great example is France and Britain. They still don't get along. They're going to get into wars. Washington made it very clear we need to stay neutral don't get involved, don't send troops, don't ask for favors, don't send money, just stay out of it. Because if you start getting involved in other nations, problems or business, that means you're gonna have to take more of a military role and we don't have the power in our military in our country to do that just yet. Now, we would follow Washington's advice very carefully for like 100 years. Uh, Shad, we owe a lot of countries. It's very complicated. We have a very strong economy, but we also owe money. It's complicated. We'll talk more about it as the months go on. All right. But essentially, Muiz, yes, we didn't listen to any of his warnings at all. The only one we listened to is number four. We do stay neutral in foreign policy for a while. That will change late in the 1800s and early 1900s where we choose a different foreign policy. But each president's gonna have a foreign policy when they become president. Trump has one, Obama has one, George Bush has one, Franklin D. Roosevelt has one, Washington had one, but everyone followed Washington's for 100 years, okay? And now things will change. Now, right now, we do not stay neutral and do not stay out of people's business, but our situation as a country has changed, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. We are a stronger country, we have a stronger military, we don't generally lose wars, we have a strong economy, so we can afford to be more involved in other countries. And you'll learn in World War I and World War II why staying out of people's business, so to speak, can lead to some problems that we have to deal with a lot later on, aka Hitler, but that won't make much sense right now. All right, so stay neutral in foreign policy. That was his big warning, and that is by far the biggest thing on the Regents exam. I know the first question of your Unit 1 test on Monday will deal with George Washington's farewell address, so make sure your notes are good with this. Okay, um, so with that being said, we're gonna do two Regents questions and then we're out of here. Just blast them in the chat once you uh, know the answers. Uh, tomorrow at 11.59, you have the textbook Thursday due. Okay, and then this will end class here. So, during George Washington's presidency, the authority or the power of the federal government was strengthened by the what? What made our federal government stronger? and made us realize we're not to be messed with anymore. Good, two is the correct answer. Suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion. Suppression means to stop. Um, if you put a suppressor on a weapon in a video game, uh, they are eliminating the sound, okay, or lessening the sound. So in this case, we suppress the Whiskey Rebellion. The next one, which statement best describes a foreign policy followed by President George Washington? Correct answer is four, okay? So that's by far the most important answer. So um, 
I did not post the YouTube assignment to the YouTube video to late last night. I really apologize about that, but I'm going to do that now. Um, you guys are free to go. Tomorrow I will see you. We are wrapping up some of our final lessons with government, so have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Mr. Panoy, I'm going to go about the test, and I'm going to send screenshots that I answered the correct thing, but it says it was wrong. Okay. I'll, um, I'll take a look. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Mr. Panoy, have a nice the, day. You too. Bye-bye. Aura, what's up? And the assignment you posted today, do we not need to answer the